My name is John V. Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Stan Lundeen. He has served in government at local, state, and national levels. Uh, we will discuss each of these uh, separately um, as uh, pr discussion progresses. Stan is a Jamestown native. He graduated from Jamestown High School. Subsequently, he went to Duke and graduated from Duke and NYU Law School, whereupon he returned and practiced law locally. Stan, what sort of law did you practice here? It was very general. I did almost everything you can imagine. I liked uh, trial work, and for a couple of years, I was an assistant public defender on a part-time basis, and that in those years, we were just part-time public defenders. Mm -hmm. uh, so that gave me a fair amount of criminal experience. Right. I understand that you were elected mayor of Jamestown in 1969. What factors led you to run? Well, I had been chairman of the City Planning Commission, and we thought we had great plans for the city, but that they weren't being executed very well. And I just thought, well, if I can talk some of the citizens that I look up to in this community to run for the council, Maybe I'll run for mayor, and we that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And you were reelected what how many times? Uh, 71, 73, and 75. So. Goodness, goodness. So you had a, a good run on that. Um, can you tell me a little bit what some of your achievements were as mayor? Well, I think the biggest was economic development. Uh, Jamestown had suffered a loss of manufacturing jobs over many years. And we had a reputation of having a bad labor climate. And it was a, a real problem to keep and attract industry. And so we started a labor management committee. And uh, it was very successful. In March of 1972, we had a 10.2 unemployment rate uh, when no one else in the country had a double-digit unemployment. And uh, three years later, by March of 1975, it was down to 4.2%. So we saved a lot of companies. Uh, we did attract Cummins uh, to a plant near Jamestown and uh, uh, really had a tremendous effect with the Labor Management Committee. And I would say that was the number one thing that we achieved. But we did urban renewal and um, some of the infrastructure in the city and tried to be good environmental stewards as well. And, and um, that must make you feel very, very good when you look at the change in the unemployment rate and the improvement for that and, and thinking how that affected so many families. Now, subsequently, you ran in a special election for Congress in the spring of 1976. Can you tell us the surroundings of that? Yes. Uh, the congressman resigned, and the I'm a Democrat, and the district had been Republican for over 100 years. I think it was 102 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody wondered whether you would have a chance or not. I think being a special election, I thought it was a better opportunity than it would be in a presidential or a gubernatorial year. Uh, so I sounded out some people. The first out of district support I got was from an organization called the, the Committee for an Effective Congress. And uh, uh, they were in New York City, but they backed both Democrats and Republicans, various districts around the country. And uh, ultimately, I got a lot of support from labor unions, from business people. Of course, some of the business people in Jamestown that supported me as mayor had a little trouble with my going down to Washington with the partisanship and so on. But uh, it, it worked out. Uh, we actually had a Republicans for Lundin organization, mm -hmm. and I won the special election 
fairly decisively. Now, was your uh, opponent somebody from the local district, a lot of local experience like yourself? As a no, uh, he was from Elmira. Okay. And uh, he had been in Washington for 25 years. At the time, he was an assistant in the Ford White House, actually. Okay. So he had a lot of contacts. He could raise a lot of money very quickly. I didn't know whether I could raise any money outside mm -hmm. of the district, but we eventually did. And uh, uh, I think the fact that I was a local mayor who had some success, as opposed to somebody who had great political experience, but mostly out of the district, was a, a factor in the election. Right. What did the district look like at the time? It was a southern tier district, just the five counties, uh, Chautauqua, Cataractes, Allegheny, and Steuben, and Chemung, okay. where Elmira is. So it basically was Dunkirk to Elmira. Right. The southern, clearly the southern tier. And um, did that district stay in the same shape during your time in Congress? No. Uh, we had a redistricting in... Uh, 1992, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, 1990, 1982, I'm sorry. Right. And uh, uh, I added Schuyler and, Shim and Yates County, which was, is Finger Lakes area. Right. But you avoided that north-south thing with Buffalo. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, we, unfortunately, this district for 10 years uh, from... 92 to 2002 became part of a Buffalo district, and I didn't like that as well. I think these small cities and rural areas have more in common with one another than we do with the urban area. Mm -hmm. You must have been very happy to see a, a change back to a southern tier district. Yes, I was, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how many terms did you serve in Congress? Uh, I served five full terms after that first year. So uh, I ran in March for the special election and again in November, which was a pretty active year, but uh, then uh, served uh, 10 years after that. Right. Now, what committees did you serve on in Congress? I served on the Banking Committee and was very active in economic development issues uh, and also on the Science and Technology Committee. Originally, I wanted to be on science and technology because we had West Valley, a nuclear reprocessing plant that had been closed here in our district, the only one in existence in America. And I knew that we had to deal with the environmental problem. 600,000 gallons of highly radioactive waste in, in ta steel tanks in rural Cattaraugus County. And then what became of that? We uh, managed to get a, a law passed where the federal government uh, took the leadership. The state contributed some, and uh, it, the liquid waste was eventually solidified and shipped off site, and the site was cleaned up. It was quite a, a boon economically to Cattaraugus County. Mm -hmm. uh, we, over a billion dollars was eventually spent. And uh, at the uh, peak, I think there were over 600 jobs down there. <laughs> right. And then those jobs went away, but indeed, but indeed that site was cleaned up and the, the hazard was removed, right. reduced right. or removed from the district. Can you tell us what you did on the International Banking Committee? Well, uh, I became chairman of the International Development Subcommittee that had jurisdiction over the IMF and the World Bank and so on, and was fairly active uh, in that. But I also, uh, using my experience as mayor, uh, I got the Labor Management Cooperation Act passed in 1978, and uh, then I was very active with employee stock ownership plans. Mm -hmm. And I had started that in Jamestown. We, we saved several industries with employee buyouts. And so we, I partnered with Senator Russell Long from Louisiana. Whoa, what a pair. Who, who was, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> I'd come up with the ideas and Russell Lung would get them passed is sort of how it worked. That's and, a deal. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, we, we passed several laws that were beneficial to ESOPs and uh, I, that's been an interest of mine continuing even after my public uh, uh, offices. Now you have these two committee uh, foci, if we will say, um, the science part with the nuclear waste and the banking. What I didn't get, what was your undergraduate degree in? Well, my undergraduate degree was in history. Okay. Um, we, we didn't have a public policy program at Duke when I was there, right. uh, but I was involved as uh, an advisory capacity when Duke started what's now the Sanford School. Right, so bo both of those two areas I mentioned were new new work for you and you had to do some serious yes. study to, yes. to get, up to, get up to speed. Yeah, particularly that. the nuclear waste issue. I didn't know anything about it and I had to learn. Uh, as far as the economic development, that was more or less of a carryover from my time uh, as mayor. And, and actually, it was a great background for Congress because if you were talking health care policy, Jamestown had a city hospital at the time, and I was responsible for it. If you were talking energy policy, we had an electrical, municipal electric system, so we had responsibility for that. So these weren't just theories to me oh, no. as a congressman. I had some practical experience. Mm -hmm. and, and when things go bad in the middle of the night, you got the phone call and probably had to take the lead in getting the train back on the tracks for some <laughs> yeah. of that stuff. I'll tell you a funny story. There was one fella, one of my Swedish advisors, who would call me when the garbage men woke him up in the morning and say, Mayor, they woke me up, now I'm waking you up. And, uh, <laughs> so. One day I, I had a meeting down in Albany and I was the only way to get there because I had a city council meeting the night before was to get up at four o'clock in the morning and uh, I realized it was his garbage day so I called him on the phone and said, hey, this is Mayor Lundin. I'm just checking if you're okay and the <laughs> garbage men haven't bothered you. <laughs> <laughs> that guy never called me again. <laughs> Fix him. <laughs> Now, I, I understand you have a very significant reputation for your work in the peanut industry. <laughs> you better tell us about that. Yes, well, we had a large peanut manufacturer in Fredonia and one down in Horseheads near Elmira. And the two executives came to me and said, uh, the price of peanuts has doubled, the federal program is ridiculous. They, you were not allowed to grow peanuts except on certain allotments in, the, in the certain states in the United States. Uh -huh. So at any rate, I got together the consumer groups and, and the manufacturers and got them together. And we, uh, we got the peanut amendment passed in the House by an overwhelming majority. Mm -hmm. In the Senate, it went down by two votes. 50 to 48, uh, Senator Luker from Indiana had the amendment in the Senate. But unfortunately, when we went to conference, uh, uh, Jesse Helms from uh -huh. your state of North Carolina was the chairman of the conference, and we didn't get much in the way of reform of the peanut act. Okay, he wasn't, he wasn't changing the pe peanuts for you guys, huh? No. It, They'd, he'd call on me and he'd say, the gentleman from New York, like it was a disease or something. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew that uh, he was going to take care of his peanut growers. And so that's, that's what happened to them. Well, that's sort of how the, how, how the Congress worked at the time. Right. Uh, there, there, certainly not only the farm bill, but a lot of aspects were... Um, trade-offs and, and uh, pretty, pretty traditional uh, in a way, but uh, it was a great experience and Tip O'Neill was a great speaker. One time I recall he came up to me and he says, Stan, I, I'd appreciate, I know this is a tough vote for you from your district, from where you, you come from a Republican district. He said, but if you could wait and vote late, 
because a lot of the fellas watch how you vote and vote like you do, which is a lot of baloney. <laughs> uh, what he wanted was to see whether he had the votes. Yeah. And if he didn't, he was going to twist my arm good. Right. But he did have the votes, so I could vote my conscience. And this was for what? Peanuts? I, no, that was not peanuts. Uh -huh. I can't recall that. Right. I think it was a Social Security vote, but I'm right. not sure. Now, how did peanuts lead to grapes? <laughs> well, uh, we were doing very well with the peanut amendment on the floor of the house, and all of a sudden a fellow named Billy Lee Evans from Georgia came over to me, and he says, Lundeen, what are they, I know you come from a rural district up there, what do they grow where you come from? And I said, well, they grow grapes for one thing. And he said, well, what kind of a grape program do we have? And I said, Billy Lee, we've got a wonderful program. It's called Free Enterprise. Grape growers grow and, and wine and juice manufacturers uh, buy them and they uh, uh, ex negotiate over the price and, and it's called Free Enterprise. And he walked away shaking his head, came back in a little while. He says, Lundin, if you could see your way clear to withdrawing your amendment, I can guarantee you we'll have a federal grape program next year. <laughs> <laughs> I never did tell my grape growers uh, <laughs> that, but uh, that wasn't what I had in mind. But nonetheless, yeah. free enterprise. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it was sad when Welsh has moved its headquarters out of Westfield, but uh, we still have cooperatives and... Uh, fairly successful grape industry. Right. Now, so you served 11 years up thereabouts right. in the House. And how did you make your way then from House of Representatives to the state? Well, I, I was asked by Governor Cuomo to join him. Uh, he had a vacancy for a lieutenant governor, and I didn't think I had any opportunity or chance of uh, being designated as his running mate because he had run in a primary in 1982 against Ed Koch, the mm -hmm. mayor of New York. And I had been a colleague of Koch in the Congress, and he was a friend of mine. So I, I supported Koch in the primary, and of course, Mario Cuomo beat him. And I thought, he's not going to ask anybody who was with his nemesis mm -hmm. uh, to join him, but he did. and. And it worked out really good from my point of view. What, what was the interview like? <laughs> well, I went to his office up at the World Trade Center, and uh, he he talked at length and asked very few penetrating <laughs> questions. Uh -huh. And at the end of it, after we he talked mostly for. Uh, over an hour, and uh, he said, would you want to join me? And I said, I sure would. And, and that worked out then? Yeah. Uh, it was an opportunity for somebody from a remote part of the state without any great personal wealth to have a statewide constituency. And I admired Governor Cuomo, and he was a great guy to work for, absolute integrity, very hardworking, and... Uh, uh, he gave me a lot of opportunity, included me in almost all the decision-making process and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And what years then were you in, in the state government? We were elected in 86 and again in 90. And uh, uh, so I was uh, in state government from 87 to 94. Uh -huh. So about eight years. Eight years then. Mm -hmm. And what are the duties of the lieutenant governor? <laughs> whatever the governor wants them to be. Uh -huh. uh, in the Constitution, you are supposed to preside over the state senate and then succeed the governor uh, uh, if he's disabled or out of state. But um, it, as a practical matter, it depends on whether the governor wants to include you or not. Mm -hmm. And so did you have any uh, special projects that you worked on for that administration? Yeah. I had a number of them. Um, I was very active in economic development, and I carried over my 
uh, interest in employee stock ownership to the state. And uh, I also was the so-called drug czar. Right. Uh, the, we had a terrible drug problem in New York in the 80s. And um, the responsibility at the state level cut across various departments. Mm -hmm. So the governor wanted somebody that could bring people together and uh, coordinate efforts, and we did. Um, I, I don't know to what extent I could say we uh, achieved things. Uh, we, I think we got more money for drug treatment than ever before, and we had a few demonstration projects which were very interesting, and I learned a lot. I learned about community policing by walking the streets in Brooklyn and uh, Newburgh and various places in our demonstration projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, early on in the administration, he asked me to take the state's effort for a superconducting super collider, a right. massive research project. Right. And uh, we did not succeed. Texas beat us out for that. Of course, Texas had the Speaker of the House and and uh, the majority leader in the Senate, so we we were in in some uh, some handicap in competing, but uh, that was also an interesting experience. And you held some town meetings about the state for that, did you? Yeah, I did. Where? How did those uh, go? <laughs> Uh, it was a variety. Uh, w one of our sites, we picked three sites, and one of them was in the North Country, and they had the high school band out, and everybody was cheering, and they wanted the jobs, is mm -hmm. what they were mm -hmm. interested in. Another one was down in the Hudson Valley, and they were really negative. Uh, I promised that I would stay until everybody had a chance to speak, and I didn't get out of there till 2 o'clock in the morning. And then we had a third site in the Rochester area, and I thought that that would be our best possibility because of the technology orientation of the greater Rochester area. But they were, they were fiercely, the people in the Henrietta area were fiercely opposed. In fact, uh, they... Uh, caused a demonstration that that was the only frightening experience I really had as lieutenant governor uh, surrounded my car out in a rural area and, oh. uh, it was and had sticks and so on and, uh, I had a state trooper driver who who very cleverly got me out of it good good now you left government then in 94. Right. And you've been involved in private industry since then. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit of what you've done? Yeah, I f followed up my interest in employee stock ownership uh, and helped with the government. The biggest privatization ever by the federal government formed something called the U.S. Investigation Services, doing all the background investigations for all the departments of government, uh, other than those at the very top level done by the FBI. And that was a great success. Uh, from my point of view, a little unfortunately, eventually it was sold to a private equity firm because the employee owners decided they wanted to cash out. They, wanted, they wanted the money that, uh, that the private equity was offering. And so that went away. But at any rate, uh, that led to my uh, involvement with American Capital Limited, which is a company that was a public company, but uh, competed with uh, private equity doing uh, lending and buyouts for mid-sized companies. Right, right. Now let's go a step further and and when you and I served on the Board of Trustees in Chautauqua Institution, you were always the one who could argue the local issues better than anybody, and it was clearly from the heart. What are some of the local issues that, that we ought to be attending to here in this county? Well, I think uh, uh, the 
the fundamental base of the economy of Chautauqua County is still industrial, mm -hmm. and we have to pay attention to that. But these days, with worldwide competition, you have to run hard just to stay even with uh, manufacturing and and so on. Uh, uh, more and more, like Chautauqua Institution, we've become more of a service economy, and the lake is re Chautauqua Lake. It's really important. Of course, being our our northern Chautauqua is on Lake Erie, which is also, also a great asset. Right. But uh, Chautauqua Lake has problems, and we really have to address those. Uh, I I'd say. Those are the main things. I mean, there are many other aspects. Right. Uh, right. And how about the, how about the school districts? <laughs> well, I'm a great believer that New York has too much government. Um, we have too many layers of local government, and particularly school districts. In Chautauqua County, we have 18 school districts. Everyone with a superintendent earning over $100,000 a year. Now, I don't mind the salary exactly, but I mind the fact that we've got 18 separate school districts that aren't providing the best kind of education for these young people. And uh, But getting consolidation is very difficult. Governor, who at the time, Governor Spitzer, asked me to head up a statewide uh, council on government consolidation. And I did, but the progress has been slim. And here in Chautauqua County, we, we try. There's still an effort between the county and the city of Jamestown as far as consolidating the police and sheriff's department. But uh, it hasn't materialized right. yet. And right. uh, there's an effort to consolidate Panama and Clymer school systems. but that's uh, encountered serious opposition. So it's a real problem, but um, it's interesting. I did a little research when I was in Congress, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, re back before we had a constitution, the New England colonies had townships, and the southern colonies had counties. And New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania adopted everything. <laughs> and, and we've had too much government ever since, in my opinion. Now, I believe that many of the southern states, Virginia is a good example, uh, have countywide school districts. And if you compare uh, suburban Washington, Fairfax County, Virginia, with the school districts of ours on Long Island mm -hmm. with the same population, their taxes are half of what ours are, and their schools are not <laughs> not that bad. Yeah. Uh, and, and part of it is just too much overlap. Right. Too much overhead, too, in the yes. buildings. And, and where I am in Wake County in North Carolina that's centralized schools, um, every high school is at least 1,000 students or substantially more, and therefore they can offer a much better set of electives for students. Yeah, and, we can. It, it, uh, and back to Chautauqua County, every single one of those 18 school districts has declining enrollments. So it's, it's obvious that you have fewer and fewer graduates, you can provide fewer and fewer opportunities for those young people, and we have a good BOCE system with two centers, but, right. uh, but as far as the general education, it's too divided, and in my opinion, as far as local government, right. it's, it's just ridiculous. Take Dunkirk and Fredonia, they're side by side, and if you, if you didn't know the, the political differences, you'd say, why would you have more than one government? Right, right, one town. Stan, we are nearly out of town, out of time. What else do we need to cover? I don't know. Well, uh, I, I thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my experience and a little about my viewpoints. Uh, and, and I think 
I appreciate your compliment about being on the Chautauqua board and bringing the local perspective. I think that's very important. I think that's essential for Chautauqua Institution. I do too. And, and I'm very sincere. You were the one who knew it, was articulate, and at the right time at that point was made. I'm encouraged that Michael Hill, the new president, really cares about the community. Me too. Me too. This has been great fun. Do Thank come you. back. Thank, Thank you, you so, so very much.